I gave a title uh, to our program this morning uh, as a bit of history, roots, blues, beauty, and resiliency with uh, thinking of the threads of our features this morning. So to celebrate and understand our ancestors, our roots, and pay tribute to the challenges we face in life as well as the joys and the beauty of life. And I look forward to uh, getting started with our lineup this morning, beginning with poet Bonnie Bishop. Bonnie lives in Nahant, and she grew up in Pittsburgh, where she spent her summers as a child on Lake Erie, uh, some time on her great-grandfather's farm, where she liked to play things like tag and wiffle ball, hide and seek in the woods she'd play, picking blueberries. Her work? Uh, involved being a teacher at an alternative high school for 33 years. She's been writing poetry for many years as well, and she has been an active member of the Every Other Thursday poetry group for 20 years. She has had poems published in the English Journal, the Larcombe Review, the Sow's Ear, and many other journals as well. And she has her first book of poetry published in 2009, Local Habitation. And I'd just like to uh, read a quote by her before she comes up to share her poetry this morning, which I think uh, I really appreciated. First, going into history a little bit, Bonnie said, globally, poetry serves as a great and important medium of cultural exchange and understanding. I'm filled with awe and respect for the poets who emerge from within the struggle for human rights. In a sense, poetry is on the side of history. There's so much trouble in the world, near and far. Without poetry and literature, I fear that I might just sink under the weight of it all. Poetry connects us to what endures. Call it hope, call it love or spirit, or a small boat in a stormy sea. I cannot imagine my life without poetry. And now, I very much look forward to hearing the poetry of Bonnie Bishop as she comes to share some of her po boat of poetry for all of us. Please give a warm welcome this morning to Bonnie Bishop. Warm, warm thanks to you, Cheryl, and to all the crew. It is thrilling to be here this morning. Thank you. And what a great introduction. Thanks. I'm going to begin uh, with a new poem. Uh, a lot of, as you'll hear, many of my poems are inspired by art. And uh, I, rather than writing about an existing art object, I decided to create one, a self-portrait in the way of the Renaissance painters or those great Copley portraits at our MFA in Boston and assemble around me things that tell you a bit about who I am. Self-portrait with objects. I'm wearing my turquoise bathing suit, yellow cap, and swim goggles. A striped towel hangs over the arm of my chair. On the wall behind me, a colorful map of the world beside a window that opens to the sea. On its sill, nine moon snail shells I've arranged by size, and a jar of sea glass Lavender, cobalt, bottle green. A notebook lies open on a wooden desk. Nearby, a box of pencils, handheld sharpener, and a stack of books whose titles vary depending on the day. Also, today's New York Times, a calico cat, a plate of garden tomatoes, radio, brass singing bowl from Katmandu, an ancient, gnarly jade plant, and a delicate, pearl-handled mirror face down. In the lower left, a white corner of blank canvas shines, and your dear hand is lifting a finely bristled brush. This poem uh, comes from having seen a uh, speaker at a show at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem. Uh, the show was Chinese paper cuts, beautiful, exquisite uh, paper cuts. And this is a, a little uh, talk. This is kind of a found poem. Uh, 
from the paper cut artist himself, the paper cut artist's advice. And in a way, it's kind of my Ars Poetica, I guess. Pin the paper securely to your cutting board. In your mind's eye, picture the figure entirely. Tiger, acrobat, panda, peony or snowflake, whatever you like. Locate the design you desire in the field of untouched paper. Take your time. Look long and hard. When you see it clearly, open the large negative spaces and carefully excise all extraneous material. <coughs> Save lashes, tassels, and fringe for last. Use a sharp knife. This poem also uh, just came out in the Sow's Ear, which is a lovely little magazine from Winchester, Virginia. Uh, <clears throat> I was visiting the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City on the way to that fantastic huge room where the Temple of Dendar is, and a little cartouche caught my eye. Back up. The cartouche along the top of the scroll reads backwards from the afterlife toward this one as it describes the myriad dangers that trouble an Egyptian on the way to heaven. Here, for example, the traveling soul is attacked by four crocodiles drawn with pointy teeth and scaly jaws. A spirit guide rattles his spear and threatens in no uncertain hieroglyphs. Retreat, back up, O oh crocodile. Do not come after me, for I live on magic. Happy choice, On. It secures an essential vitality, as if magic were air, or water, or bread. I approach the temple of Dendar, outside the window wall. People, mummy-wrapped mummy against the chill in Central Park, scroll by. Inside, I am rehearsing. I live on magic. I live on magic. As if the incantation might fend off crocodiles wherever they find me in this world or the next. Going uh, into nature, as I said, as Cheryl said, I had mentioned in my um, notes to her, it is a troubled world we live in, and I, like many others, often find refreshment in the natural world. Last spring, I was on the what they call the Forgotten Coast along the panhandle of Florida, beautiful area. And, but I found, try as I might, I was unable to keep that political turmoil that we're in out. So this is kind of a confluence of that beautiful coast and other ideas. Morning on the Forgotten Coast for Jim and Ellen. Lezer, sorry, legs scissor snipping quickly, Willet, ruddy turnstone and sanderling, crisscross veils of foam, curtsy to the breaking waves, but are indifferent to the royal wedding. <laughs> Crabs have dung, dug deep holes slantwise into the sand. Around them, the crazy tracks of nighttime skittering. When we stretch out nearby, they emerge, fix tiny black lenses on our enormous bodies, gathering necessary intel. A squadron of red-mouthed laughing gulls screeches overhead. In the choppy gulf, bottlenose dolphins swim coastwise. The arc of their rising and falling thrills us beyond all reason. There they are, we cry out, wading into the swells, awash with love and shame. The blowout, oil slick, dispersant. In the sanctuary, at the end, at the end of the island, far from the arguments of Congress, two fledgling eagles tussle. A pie-billed grebe swings his clownish face from left to right, from right to left. He does not bring up any position or principle. 
a brown thrasher demolishes an anthill while the cerulean beak of a little blue heron stabs through the sin skin of a brackish pond. After dark hours of hunting, a nighthawk sleeps on a pine bough, tears of gray feathers puffed up above the rough gray bark. This is a true story. Uh, from when I was living in Somerville, which is where I taught all those years. For Glendy Mendez, 18, accused of murdering her newborn son and leaving his body in a trash bag in the driveway next to the house where I once lived. You arrived pregnant from Salvador six months ago, got a job at the Burger King, your roommates told reporters you had always been heavy, wore baggy clothes. They said they didn't know you were pregnant. I believe you didn't know what to expect. You had no mama, no aunt, no sister-in-law or abuela to hold a string in front of your belly and pronounce boy or girl, to tell you tales of morning sickness, backache, labor or delivery. You had no baby shower, no woven necklace to keep the evil eye off, no tiny shoes on your dresser, no stack of pampers, no rocking chair, no cradle, no baby magic, no mobile of God's eyes turning in the sweet spring above your waiting bassinet. You had no confession in the incense-laden gloom, no hasty wedding, no prenatal checkup, no ultrasound, no vitamins, no green card, no language class, no bilingual social worker, no WIC, no Lamaze, no explanation for your leaking breasts. Instead, you had your big belly, your triple X sweatshirts, confusion, nausea, and fatigue. And last Saturday, while the lilacs bloomed in my old yard, you had your water breaking, your pain, your blood, contractions, the agony alone in your second story bedroom, biting hard on a towel to keep from screaming, the baby's head crowning, blood spattering, the porcelain, the little body slipping from you onto the floor, slimy, gasping, attached. You had your disbelief and your desperation, but no one to turn to. So you broke him into silence and disposed of your shame, his body and the placenta in a white plastic bag from under the sink. You put it in the driveway, but the trash man found it. And now you have cops and cameras, assistant district attorneys and arrest. Glendy Mendez, you could have been my neighbor. What is left for you to expect? This is a, a wonderful time of year. And um, I'm going to read a couple of seasonal poems. Uh, I was able to take the Clinton's medical leave and go and spend my mother's last five weeks with her as she was dying from cancer about 10 years ago. And I wrote this uh, for her. Late bloomer, my mother always said I was one, and so I feel a kinship with foxhole conversions and ninth inning home run hitters. Especially in this maligned month of November, I love the convoluted cabbage rows, bedraggled daisies in their second flowering, the puffs of lavender asters straggling along the fence. I take heart from the rumors of witch hazel breaking into clouds of tiny yellow blooms in dark woods where I have never walked. And friendships begun when days are shrinking like an iris in a twilit sky. And those who, like her, conscious that death is close as night, grow graceful tendrils, bud and blossom amazing the vigilant beside the bed. Another November poem. We're not quite there yet, but we're on our way. Uh, the epigraph for this one is taken from Psalm 91. November sunrise. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts 
to wisdom. We ignore last night's dishes and today's newspapers on the front stoop to sit in the dark, blankets on our laps, warming our hands around cups of tea. No need to speak. Most of the leaves have tumbled onto the grass, soft doubloons, abundant as memories. Their shiny deaths have opened up the sky for us. This morning, as it softens from black to saturated blue-gray, a crackled glaze of branches emerges a puzzle with a million ink-limbed pieces. Past the neighbor's hemlocks, along the line between sea and sky, a smudge of saffron, bleeding rose, a blast of liquid gold. You'd think we could hear the day cracking open, trumpets or cannon or rending of silk. 22,500 47 and counting. The last poem I'd like to read is, uh, has an epigraph from a Chinese legend uh, and brings together a confluence. I've been looking for the perfect peach all summer. I haven't found one this year. Um, but I think, yes, people recognize that longing. Um, so this is called The Peach of Longevity. And the, the uh, legend uh, says that a single bite grants 10,000 years to Chinese immortals who are summoned to the Western paradise to partake. One, from the alluvial soil between glacial ridges in northern Ohio grew the peaches of my childhood. Mother bought them by the peck at farm stands on Lake Road. Though I disliked the fuzzy skin, their sweet flesh, concentrated globes of sunshine, sliced on cereal or over vanilla ice cream, mixed with blueberries and chunks of cantaloupe, or eaten by halves split from the convoluted seed, while juice ran like a river down my chin. Oh, Lord, these were the peaches of paradise. Two. Only once I found their equal, and not for want of looking, in a shadow of a cathedral in a village above a river in southwest France. Each fruit was nestled in a corona of purple tissue offered in a shop built right up against the back wall of the church. Three wooden crates were labeled with handmade signs, aujourd'hui, demain, après demain. We chose two bought some hard white cheese, salami, a baguette, and a bottle of the local red. At the edge of the sunflower field beside the river, we feasted. Three. In the White Horse Temple, near the Yellow River, cast in bronze, the size of a stallion's rump, the peach of longevity rests on a pedestal of stone Legend promises long life to all who will place a hand on it and walk three times around. I stand aside watching a monk in saffron robes sweep yellow leaves across the courtyard. The blue smoke of incense carries the prayers of the faithful to heaven. After her stroke, my grandmother lived on, bedridden and mute. Come what may, I'll take my peaches for today. Thank you. The poem is called The Gulls of Nahant. And I was walking the dog around one day, and I just looked up, and I saw a group of, of gulls up in the circling in the way that they do, and wrote this. Above this near island of rock and sand, the air is held up by a large band of gulls that fly high sometimes, near out of sight, or tumble and dance, acrobats in gray-white. 
then rise like a stairway up to the kingdom where even a carrion eater is welcome. Thank God for gulls and their heavenly prowling. If it wasn't for them, we'd have all creation pounding down on our deafened ears. And the small waves would bear us away. And the crabs, those red crows of the shallows, would take us apart with a merry clicking of claws. Thank you. This guitar was owned by a road-weary blues man. Cindy fell on hard times and needed cash. So he walked into this pawn shop to find its value. Tried to turn it all to gold from mountain ash. Yeah, this old pawn shop has many stories. Tales can be told from each item on the shelf. And every time you come in browsing round here, you learn a little something about yourself. On the wall were a pair of blue speckled coffee cups, just like the ones my grandma used to use. A two-quart pot warmed out on an open flame An early morning smell of a chicory brew There's a leather-bound book written in 1902 About a farmer who lived east of here up on the hill He was a loner, spoke to no one Built his home, plowed his field, and paid his bills. Yeah, this old pawn shop has many stories. Tales can be told from each item on the shelf. And every time you come in browsing round here, you learn a little something about yourself. On the table are some crocheted doilies Near a lamp with a shade the moths got to It had beads and bangles along the gilded edges Once a beauty, now that shade is far from new And in the corner there was a musty smell from old army blankets left there in a chest. I wondered who the last was to be warmed by them. Maybe a soldier on their way home for a rest. Yeah, this old pawn shop has many stories. Tales can be told from each item on the shelf. And every time you come in browsing round here, Learn a little something about yourself. Now in all these years that I've run this pawn shop, many a character has come and gone. They all brought in something special for the money, yet their stories left me the richer one. Yeah, this old pawn shop has many stories. Tales can be told from each item on the shelf. And every time you come in browsing round here, you learn a little something about yourself. You learn a little something about yourself. When my head inside feels black, 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 I want to make paper cry. I use a pen to cut the paper until its thin skin weeps in pain. Then I let my tears out too. Sometimes we cry out of frustration, 
sometimes for all the loss and sadness in the world, because it's overwhelming and we feel helpless, a person, a pen, and paper. Yesterday I was driving to work when I saw through the trees three deer with feet wrapped in fog. Sometimes I see a white horse in this same field, but that morning in the milky light stood the gift of three deer. I want to use a pen to make paper catch its breath in appreciation at the splendor of wild animals. Then together we'll sigh in happiness at all the beauty quietly present in the world. Thanks. I was inspired to uh, write this poem several years ago uh, when one of my grandchildren was three. And uh, I've always been extremely hard on myself, so this particular experience uh, was very meaningful to me. The name of the poem is Forgiven. I was sitting at the sandbox on one bright and sunny morn when James came out to join me, and so a new game was born. I was asked to tidy up and put some order in his box. So I promptly picked up all the toys and I lined up all the rocks. He returned in just a moment with a look of great dismay. Why did you empty out my cups? They were for us to play. Oh, so sorry, James. I didn't know. What did you want to make? It's OK, Nana. I'm not mad. It was just a little mistake. <laughs> Thank you. And pear, apricot, then the